to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're continuing our verse by verse study through the book of 1 Corinthians. Today we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, resuming our study in verse number 1. So, grab your Bible if you are able to do that. Open it up to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, and we'll begin. But let's pray. Father, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, our third study in the book of 1 Corinthians begins in chapter 3, verse 1, and it reads, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. And so we learn from this that the Corinthian Christians were not following Jesus the way they should have been. They should have been further along in their walk with the Lord than what they were. They were allowing their own feelings and their own desires to lead them instead of Jesus and the Word of God. And any time we allow our desires that oppose the Word of God to direct us. We are carnal Christians. Actually, we go from being a spiritual Christian to a carnal Christian the second we commit sin. And we go from being a carnal Christian to a spiritual Christian when we repent and confess. It happens that quickly. We may not feel spiritual because we just finished sinning, followed by repentance and confession, but we are spiritual. In the eyes of God, we are. And that's the only thing that matters. You know, we need to quit looking at ourselves and judging ourselves according to our feelings and instead begin to judge ourselves by what the Word of God says. And the fact is, we are carnal as long as we walk in the flesh following the desires of our sin nature. We are spiritual as long as we let the Holy Spirit lead us. And that can change second by second. You know, sometimes put, people put Christians into two major categories, carnal and spiritual, as if they're locked into that kind of long term. Well, I suppose they could be. But actually, like I said, it changes from second to second, depending on who you're following, your flesh or the Holy Spirit. So don't be quick, too quick to call someone a carnal Christian if they've repented and they've confessed. Because at that second, they are not. Verse 2. I have fed you with milk and not with solid food. For to this time you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able? You know the difference between spiritual milk and solid spiritual meat isn't one doctrine versus another or one Bible verse verse versus another. That doesn't determine what is spiritual meat and spiritual milk. The milk of any teaching is its basic truth. The meat is the rich, in-depth meaning that can be pulled out of that basic truth. Verse 3, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Amazingly, they were envying others, they were carnal, and they should have been further along, as I said, than this in their walk with the Lord. But Christians who envy others and demand their own way are carnal Christians while they're doing that. They are spiritual babies, no matter what their physical age may be. In behavior, they are no different than the unsaved. They are spiritual toddlers sucking their thumb and throwing a tantrum when they can't have, their, can't have their own way. Spiritual babies. A lot of churches are filled with spiritual babies whining and crying and sucking their spiritual thumbs because they can't have their own way over some silly, stupid thing that doesn't have anything to do with the Bible. 
I have no tolerance for that kind of stuff. Verse 4. For while one says, I'm of Paul, and another, I'm of Apollos, are ye not carnal? You know what they were doing? I, I guess we looked at this, what was it, last week, maybe the week before? They were lining up with human leaders instead of focusing on Jesus. Well, that tells me right there, they're not being led by the Holy Spirit. They're being led by their flesh. Because they were, they were lining up with human leaders instead of focusing on Jesus, and then after taking sides, they would argue about which human leader was the best. Why would they do that? What sense does that make? The Holy Spirit never leads Christians to focus their attention on church leaders, on denominations, on Christians, on preachers. He leads people to focus their attention on Jesus Christ. Jesus said, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will speak of me. He will point people to me. So if you go to a church, and all they talk about is their programs and their committees and their denominations and their numbers and this and that, that's not being led by the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, the reason, and if you're, if you're a strong Christian, you don't like that, congratulations, you shouldn't. I wouldn't stay in a church like that. I wouldn't support a church like that because it's not being led by the Holy Spirit. Verse 5. Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos but ministers by whom he believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? You know what a minister is? Yeah, he says somebody who wears one of them backwards collars and dresses in black. No. A minister is a servant. That's what the word means. And that's what ministers are supposed to be, and nothing else. They're not to sit in some big old fancy chair and have people kiss their rings or bow before them or anything like that. A minister is a servant of Jesus Christ, and that means live every moment of every day to please God. They are servants of Jesus Christ live every moment of every day to please God. If they're not doing that, they're not good ministers. They're not good servants. It means dying to self and doing what Jesus wants, even if it leads to hardship, even if it leads to poverty, even if it leads to death. Now, a lot of people in pulpits today are not ministers of Christ because they're watering down the word of God because they don't want hardship and they don't want to lose their pension and they don't want to lose their job. They're not servants of Jesus Christ. You know, no one cares what a servant wants. And actually the word is slave. No one cares what a slave wants. And a slave shouldn't care what he wants either. A slave of Jesus Christ is, is, is to be concerned only about what Christ wants. And that's it. Six. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. No preacher or teacher is wise enough or eloquent enough to convince someone else to become a Christian or to convince a Christian to live like Jesus. You just can't do it. It doesn't work that way. A good teacher, you know what a good teacher will do? A good teacher will proclaim the word of God so that the Holy Spirit can take that word and lead people to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. That's why teaching the pure word of God and nothing else is the mark of a good minister. You get ministers who are involved in administration, they're involved in counseling, they're involved in anything and everything. Programs, committees, leading this group, leading that group, doing everything with their time other than praying, studying, and teaching the word of God. The focus is completely wrong. Seven. So then, neither is he that plants anything, neither is he that waters, but God that gives the increase. You know, you could do a good job plowing and planting and watering in your garden if you have one. You can pull out all the weeds, man, but if God doesn't get add his blessing to those crops, then you're not going to get any vegetables. And likewise, someone can teach the word of God, but even if that someone is the great apostle Paul, if God doesn't add his blessing to the word of God, then no one's going to repent and no one's going to learn 
and no one's going to get saved, and no one's going to be sanctified. And so, if you get anything out of my teachings, it's only because God has blessed his word, and therefore he deserves all the credit. I like hearing encouragement. I mean, anybody would. So I'm not saying don't send me encouraging words if the word of God is blessing you, but always remember that God deserves the praise. Verse 8. Now he that plants and he that waters are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Now, I don't know why the Christians in Corinth were taking sides with Paul or Apollos or Peter or anybody else for that matter, because these guys were not competitors. They were all on the same team. Why are you making them competitors in your own puny little carnal minds? doesn't make any sense. They were all working for Christ. And they were all, they all will be, I should say, or all have been by now, rewarded for their faithfulness. And God will judge how much reward each and every servant of God gets. So, it was foolish for Christians to argue about which one was the greatest. Because that's God's job. He will determine that. Just like he determines today what reward you will get based on your faithfulness. And only he knows. Verse 9, for we are laborers together with God. You are God's cultivated field. You are God's building. The Corinthians were God's garden. Paul and Apollos worked as farmers in that garden. They were co-workers, drafted by God to teach the word and as a result, help God's people to grow spiritually. And each one of us is a plant in God's garden. And when we listen to solid Bible teachers, that's when we are watered and fed. And because of that, we grow. We grow spiritually. We grow in holiness. It comes through the Word of God by faithful Bible teachers. And of course, by you spending your own time in the Lord, or I should say in the Word of God. Ten, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let every man take heed how he builds upon it. Paul was in Corinth for 18 months, and he laid the foundation for the faith of the Christians there. He got things going. He told the facts about Jesus, which caused many people to repent and receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. Other teacher, teachers followed Paul, who helped the Christians to grow spiritually. And as Paul says right here, let every man take heed how he builds thereupon, though. And that's important to see. In other words, if a man of God is going to build upon someone else's faith, is going to build on someone's faith, help, help it along a little bit, then he has to be careful how he builds. In other words, he has to teach and preach the Word of God, because otherwise it's not going to happen. It's not going to grow. Verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So now he reverts back to the foundation. you got to have that foundation in place if you're going to grow into a strong Christian. What is the foundation? Well, the foundation is the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the foundation. The foundation for salvation is the cross of Jesus Christ, and God's not going to accept any other plan, any plan that excludes the cross or adds human works to the work of Christ on the cross is rejected by God. That person is rejected by God. The person who adheres to that faulty foundation is rejected by God. They're not saved. You have to trust in the cross of Christ plus nothing else. You have to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior and trust in his finished work on the cross. There you have laid the foundation for your faith. That is the foundation for your salvation and your faith. Then you build on that by studying the Word of God. So, Jesus Christ, who He is, the sinless Son of God, and what He did, died on the cross to pay for our sins, that is the foundation of the church. It's the foundation of our salvation. 12. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, 
wood, hay, stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall test every man's work of what sort it is. You know, we're, we're all going to stand. Every single Christian is going to stand before Jesus Christ, and our works are going to be judged. And that judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, which is for Christians, is going to reveal if we accomplished anything for Christ after we were saved, and it will reveal what, if anything, we did for his glory. That's what that judgment's about. It's not about sin. It's about rewards. That judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, that we're all going to stand in front of Christ, and we're going to face that the moment we die. That's not an end time judgment. That, that happens right after we die as Christians. That judgment is going to determine the level of rewards that we receive in eternity in addition to our salvation. And what that means is that our actions, words, and motives will all be examined by the Lord Jesus Christ after we die and we will be rewarded according to according to what we've done, and those rewards will be in addition to the gift of salvation, which is ours when we receive Christ. So you got the gift of salvation, which is yours the moment you get saved by receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You're saved, you're declared righteous, but then after that, your level of rewards in addition to your salvation, which will determine how much you enjoy eternity and your salvation, will be determined by how much you live for Jesus. What you do, what you give, you know, what you did for his glory. 14. If any man's work abide which he has built upon it, he shall receive a reward. And, and that's what I was just talking about. The good things that Christians do, big or small, doesn't matter, they're going to be rewarded. God doesn't overlook anything. Nothing we do for Jesus is insignificant in the eyes of God. It might be insignificant to others, but it's not to God. And, and again, I want to stress, salvation is a gift, but the degree to which we enjoy that gift of salvation throughout all eternity will be determined by how much we do and give and live for Jesus on this planet before we die. 15. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet as by fire. If we die in right standing with God through Jesus Christ, because we have faith in Christ and we're trusting in the cross, and he's our Lord and our Savior, um, but we pretty much wasted our life doing meaningless things, then yes, we will make it to heaven, but eternity is not going to be anywhere near what it could have been for us. Just Here's an example. You take the, the criminal who died next to Jesus on the cross next to him, He's in heaven, but he's not enjoying his salvation anywhere near as much as, say, the Apostle Paul or Peter or anybody else who lived for Jesus a long time. God is fair. 16. Know ye not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. You know what a temple is? I'm talking about even in the pagan world. A temple is designed to show off a God. Could be a phony god, doesn't matter. They build a temple to show off their god. A temple is designed to put a god on display. With the Holy Spirit in us, as Christians, we become the real God's temple. He dwells in us, He lives in us. And we remain here on earth for one very important reason. To show the world that the real God is holy and good. We are to live in a way that shows off God. We're the temple of God. We are to put God on display. We are to live in a way that honors God and puts the real God on display. 17. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Bad behavior by Christians stops the work of the Holy Spirit in them. And it ruins God's temple. And God says he's going to destroy those who would ruin his temple. And it doesn't say what. It doesn't say how. 
And to be honest with you, I don't need to know how. I just know that I don't want to be a part of that sort of thing. I don't want to deface God's temple through an ungodly lifestyle. And I don't want to be judged by God in whatever way he's going to do it for being that way. I'd just rather live for Jesus out of appreciation for him dying on the cross and paying for my sin. Live for Jesus, confess when I fail, that's fine with me. If I do that, I'll be thrilled. And I don't always do it like I should. 18. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may be wise. Intellectual pride. You think you're smart. God says, why don't you become a fool? Become a fool. Just acknowledge that you're not a know-it-all. Acknowledge that you need the wisdom of God found in the Word of God. Humble yourself and acknowledge that you don't have your act together the way you should because no one does. Pray to God for direction. Pray to God for leading. Pray to God for help. Live for Him. Read your Word. Submit to the Word of God and quit acting like, like you don't need that sort of thing. Verse 19. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. The wisdom of this world is foolishness, according to God. You know why? It is because the wisdom of this world can't save a single soul from hell. I don't care how elaborate the plan is that man comes up with. It can't save a single soul from hell. And also the wisdom of this world does not satisfy our deepest spiritual needs. You're not going to get it from some human philosophy. It only comes from receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and then getting in the Word and fellowshipping with Jesus and living for Him. 20. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. The wisdom of man, no matter how many degrees they may earn, cannot produce real, long-term, from the heart, lasting solutions to sinful behavior. It cannot produce solutions that glorify God. The wisdom of man cannot do that. The wisdom of man, the philosophies of man, the programs and the te techniques of man do not work. You say, but, but some of those things, you know, I, I've been reading a book by a, a, a philosopher, by a, by a psychologist or a counselor, and some of those things, you know, I found some things that line up with Scripture. Well, yeah. And every now and then, if you try hard enough, you can find a decent piece of bread in a garbage can. Just walk down the street and dig through everybody's garbage can. Chances are, if you do it long enough, you're going to find an edible piece of bread. But it's still foolish to look for food there when you've got a refrigerator full of healthy stuff to eat in your house. And the Bible is a refrigerated refrigerator full of spiritual food, spiritual directions, and the power to carry them out. So why dig through the trash of human ideas, human philosophies, and maybe luck out every now and then and find one tiny little morsel that might be right? Why do that, though, when you have a Bible that never misses? See? That's why it doesn't make sense to study anything but the Bible. That's why it doesn't make sense to look anywhere other than the Bible for spiritual strength and spiritual direction. We need to get back to the Bible completely, totally in our churches, in our ministries. And I'm talking about verse by verse from Genesis through Revelation. 21. Therefore, let no man glory in man. Now that's, let no man glory in man. Why? Well, because the Bible says that we're dust. That's a good reason. Why would you glory in somebody who's nothing but dust? Don't glory in men. We're just unworthy servants of God. And you say, well, I don't like that kind of talk. Don't tell me that I'm an unworthy person because that hurts my self-esteem. I don't like that kind of talk. Well then, maybe you should quit listening to teachers who fill your mind with foolish, high-sounding ideas that appeal to your pride. And maybe you ought to just start listening to Jesus Christ because he said that even after you have done everything that God expects of you, still 
you are an unprofitable servant. That's what you are. And that's why God says, do not glory in any man. Glory in Jesus. And how he uses people, but glory in Jesus. 21 again. Therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. You know, the, the Corinthian Christians were actually limiting themselves by following one man of God. And remember, that's what they were doing. Oh, I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. I follow Peter. They were limiting themselves because by doing that, they were wasting the other teachers that were in Corinth that God gave them. Every single human writer of Scripture and every Orthodox Bible teacher is a gift to the church from Jesus Christ. They are a gift from Jesus. But they are not to be the focus as if they were something beyond a servant of God because that's all they are. Don't glory in men. Every one of us is a servant of God. And that's not just Bible teachers and pastors. Every single Christian is to be a servant of God, a slave of Jesus Christ, not our own will, but God's will be done. And we should be seen as instruments to help the spiritual growth of other Christians. That's why we're here. We're not here to be put on a pedestal. No matter how much God may use us, that's not our purpose. Verse 23. And ye are Christ, and Christ is God's. In other words, all of us Christians are subject to one leader, Jesus Christ. Just like Jesus was the Father's servant while he was here on earth, so we are to be servants of Christ. None of us are great. We are all servants, nothing more. Jesus is the only one who is inherently good. Jesus is the only one who is inherently great. You want to be a part of this ministry? That would be wonderful because I don't have a big church and I don't have a big ministry and I don't have a big organization underwriting this ministry. I've been doing it verse by verse for 30 years now, teaching it from Genesis to Revelation. And I'd like to be I'd like you to join me. That'd be great. You know, and if you want to help us out, that would be wonderful. Our address is Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box 2211, Wasser, Wisconsin, 54402-2211. Your prayers are greatly appreciated. Again, our address is Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box 2211, Wausau, Wisconsin, 54402-2211. Email verse by verse at live.com, verse by verse at live.com. And don't forget to check out the Scripture Verse by Verse website. Again, that website is there for you to grow spiritually because everything you need to grow spiritually can be found at that website. You can study the entire Bible from Genesis through Revelation, verse by verse, at the Bible, verse by verse dot com. That's the Bible, verse by verse dot com. Till next time, Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone. Thank you.